We have here tonight, in my opinion, uh, uh, one of the greatest preachers I've ever heard in my life. And I've heard them all. I've heard them all. Uh, I never thought I'd have the day of getting to introduce this man. I've been friends at a distance for 35 years. We preached together when I was just about 23, two or three. He's about 18. And uh, I thank God for his story. He's going to tell you his life story. Some of these people are here, and I have the privilege to introduce Dr. Phil Kidd. Get him up loud, y'all. Sure. Thank you, Brother Castle. Well, it's a joy to be here. I learned one thing tonight. Not everybody uses deodorant. I can tell you that much. I... <laughs> and not everybody uses breath mints either. There was a, <coughs> there was a guy coming up to me outside, got right in my face, and said, hey! And he just need a hot dog full of onions. He said, you remember me? I said, not the name, but I remember that breath. I'll never forget your breath. Pastor Castle, thank you for letting me come. Thank you for the sacrifices at Shining Light Baptist Church and many of you have went through. Let's give them a hand to let them know how much we appreciate all that they've done tonight. I want to thank all of you preachers and youth groups for coming so far and encouraging me. I want to thank all you workers that have worked so hard to put this together, all of the cooks. I know what goes into a meeting like this. We don't take it lightly. Before I was saved, I've been drunk. I mean, real drunk. I've smoked enough pot at one time to think I could fly. But I've never got on a motorcycle drunk or high and ever tried to jump six school buses in my life. <laughs> and these fellows are sober when they're doing it. And I appreciate you men. You did a great job tonight. I want to give you my life verse, my testimony real quick, and I'll be leaving. Psalm chapter 34, if you'll turn there. I want to read one verse of scripture. Psalm chapter 34, when I got born again, my aunt told me I needed to read the Bible. And the first time I ever read this verse, the Holy Spirit of God spoke to my heart and said, this will be your verse for your whole life. Psalm chapter number 34 and verse number 6. Hey, Psalm 34, 6. This Poor men cried, and the Lord heard him, and I like this terminology, and saved him out of all his troubles. I was raised in a large ghetto with four million people living in the immediate surroundings of Cleveland, Ohio. My daddy was a heavy drinker. I lived next door to a beer joint all of my life. All I ever knew was fussing and fighting and cussing and the last thing I knew anything about was God or the Bible. My daddy drank a lot, but he worked hard. My sister, my oldest one, was 21 years older than me, and she was a barmaid in a nearby bar. She died at the age of 38 because of liquor. My brother-in-law killed himself at the age of 42 because of liquor. And my grandfather, hauling moonshine, somebody stole a load of his moonshine from his house. And in a drunken stupor, he crossed over from Alabama into Mississippi and killed a house full of men, women, and children. He went home that night in a drunken stupor and killed my grandmother and left a seven-day-old baby between her cold, stiff arms in the floor. So that's the kind of home I came up in. I remember one night when I was 10 years old, my sister came to me and said, how would you like to make some money? Living in the ghetto and being broke? That was a great opportunity at the age of 10. So I went to the beer joint where my sister was employed. There was a barmaid. And they had eight lanes of bowling, but you had to set the pins up by hand from behind the wall. And at the age of 10, I got my first job working at a beer joint. The highlight of my day would come at 2.30 in the morning on Friday and Saturdays when the joints would close down. My sister would nail the cheers back together that they broke and glue the felt back on the pool tables. And while she was doing that, I would go out in the alleyway where they would put the empty bottles back in those thick cardboard cases and I would suck all the foam out of those empty beer bottles for the first time in my life at the age of 10 in the back alley all by myself, dark on a Friday night, I got drunk. From the age of 10 to the age of 12, I worked in B&R Lounge setting up bowling pins. At the age of 12, a larger bar that was closer to where I lived wanted to hire me to cook pizzas for drunk. 
And by the way, if you've ever ate my pizza, you would understand you would have to be a sot drunk to eat what I was cooking coming out of that oven. And I started working there at the age of 12. No God, no Bible, no church. I remember one night thinking to myself, surely there's got to be more to life than getting drunk. I'd already had my first tattoo at the age of 10. And I thought there's got to be more to life than what I'm getting out of it. I remember one night as, 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 over a 25-cent game of pool, four men fell out on the front porch of that beer joint and began to fight. And as a 12-year-old boy, I watched a man take a pool stick and gouge a man's eye out of his head. I remember as it plunged through his eye and the fluid ran down the side of his face, I remember hearing a man scream like I had never heard before and I really haven't ever heard since. But that night, walking home through that ghetto at 2.30 in the morning by myself, I looked up in the star-quilted sky and said, there's got to be more to life than this. If somebody would have loved me enough to drove a bus by my house, if somebody would have loved me enough to knock on my door in a big, nasty, dirty ghetto, I may not have the testimony that I'm giving tonight. When I was 13 years old, I started home one day, and a man that lived close to me named Mickey met me in the street. He said, have you ever smoked pot? I said, no, but I heard about it. I bought my first bag of pot that night and went home and in my daddy's basement while they slept upstairs drunk. I started smoking marijuana. By the time I was 14, what I wanted and what I needed was more than I was making on weekends working at a bar. So I began to do what every stupid dope addict does. I began to sell it and deliver it to make enough money to pay for my own habits. I remember as a 14-year-old boy walking through a ghetto with a roll of $100 bills that would choke a horse. Of course, it wasn't mine. It was simply a payoff from making deliveries. You see, marijuana is not where it start, stops. It's where it starts. After a while, they want to introduce you to something a little better than that. Back then, LSD and clear window pane and liquid hash was coming out on the scene. You'd buy it by the gram, and it wasn't long until I was needing money here and money there. And before I was ever 15 years old, my life was totally out of control. I remember many nights I never had a bed till I was 15. I slept in the floor on a quilt. All of us in this little old shotgun house, I remember laying in the floor a lot of nights thinking, my God, what am I doing with my life? But nobody ever loved enough to take a Bible and show me from the Word of God how to be saved. I had no earthly idea that we were dealing with some drug dealers out of New York that was trafficking heavy stuff down the coast. I just thought I was dealing with the local man. One night in a bad situation that I couldn't get out of at the age of 15 years old, a drug deal went bad. I had to run off and leave $3,000 worth of drugs laying on a coffee table. That's probably equivalent to fifty-five dollars to $60,000 today. I had to leave it or get shot. And I remember leaving that place and I remember lead flying and women screaming and crying and reading the papers the next day of those that had gotten shot that I'd known. But little did I know who I was dealing with until they began to come to the school I was going to. They tried to find me. My daddy actually had to make me sleep under his bed at night for fear that they would break into his house and kill me in the middle of the night. It was then that I realized I was more than a sinner. I realized my life was totally out of control. Several months went by and things died down and I thought everybody kind of forgot about what had happened and I was trying my best to raise the money to get everything paid back and some of my best friends supposedly came by and said, hey, Phil, we're having a party up the road, man. They want you to be one of the guests. Everything's calmed down. There's nothing going on on the streets now. Why don't you come on up? You've been kind of hiding the last couple of months. So with some of what I thought was my best buddies, I went to a party and for the first time in three months, I went outside. But I didn't take but two or three drinks of that drink they gave me that night and I realized they'd put something inside of that drink. The room began to spin round and round and upside down and I remember falling from that old nasty couch that I was sitting on to that stiff, nasty carpeted floor and that's the last thing I remember. Five men that were supposed to be my best friends had been paid off from some hit men out of New York to kill me. They took me to a little old field not far from where my daddy lived there was a set of railroad tracks there. They ripped the clothes off of my body. They pulled both of my legs and both of my arms out of socket. They almost beat my face off of my skull, twisted me and snapped me and broke me and took my naked body and laid me upon a set of railroad tracks. They laid me on the third set of railroad tracks and somebody asked me when I gave my testimony, why did they waste the time to put you on the third row? Because they knew that night within an hour a train was scheduled to come down that metal rail and would have splattered my guts and I'd have went to hell immediately. 
My nephew was having a party down the railroad tracks in a place called Rabbit Valley. And him and some boys staggering drunk come up on my dead, bloody, naked body laying there on a set of railroad tracks. A 15-year-old kid. I didn't know it. I was completely passed out. But they found an old place where a drunk was sleeping up under a tree and they found a sheet. And they took two sticks and made a hammock out of it and put my naked, bloody body on that hammock and carried me home. I was out. I was unconscious. All I know is what they told me. They knocked on the front door, and my mama opened the door and said, My God, is that my baby? The blood was dripping through the sheets where they had beaten me. My face was bloody and purple, almost nigh unto dying. And they took my nasty, bloody body inside the house. And out of everybody that could have been sitting in that living room that night, there was Uncle Buford and Aunt Florine. Now, I didn't fool with Uncle Buford and Aunt Florine. Daddy told me they had mental issues. I wish you could meet them. They're dead now. Uncle Buford was about the size of this microphone stand right here, and that was on a good day. Aunt Florine was much wider than this pulpit. And when they would come to our house, we would make fun of them and say, yeah, Laurel and Hardy's here again, and they'd get out of their car. And as they would make their way to my house, Daddy would say, son, go out the back door and get out of here. I'd say, Daddy, what's wrong with them? He said, they got religion, son. They got religion. He said, religion will drive you crazy. He said, my great aunt read the Bible one time and spent the rest of her, mind, rest of her life in a mental ward out of her mind. But you know, Dad was right. Religion will drive you crazy. But Jesus will put you in your right mind. Just about the time I thought life could not get worse, mine did. What I did not know was Aunt Florine and Uncle Buford saw my messed up life that night and while Dad rushed me to the emergency room, they went home, born again, saved people and got a burden for Phil Kidd. I didn't know it, but every morning and every night before they would eat breakfast and before they would eat supper, they would push their chairs out and get on their knees in front of their living room table and ask God to save me. And the more they prayed, the worse I got. Every day they would pray for me. Uncle Buford and Aunt Florine prayed for me and I got shot. Uncle Buford and Aunt Florine prayed for me and I got stabbed. Uncle Buford and Aunt Florine prayed for me and I overdosed twice. Uncle Buford and Aunt Florine prayed for me and I had to go three trips to a dry out clinic. They kept praying for me. I went three trips to a mental ward. I'll never forget Aunt Florine told me after I got saved, she said one day they knelt down to pray and she said Buford looked at her and said, Honey, I don't know if this is working or not. It seems like the more we pray, the worse that boy's getting. And she leaned over and said, Buford, don't you see what God's are doing? He's a letting him go low so he can lift him up on high. Yeah. Thank God for a praying aunt that never gave up on me. Me and five other boys were walking through an alley. This made the papers and almost locked me up the rest of my life. We were walking through an alley after they had been praying for me and my daddy had given me a 32 Colt 8-shot automatic pistol. He said, son, don't ever pull it, but if you have to pull it, don't be afraid to use it. I remember the six of us were walking through that alley that night. I remember a station wagon pulled up at the end of the alley and the windows went down together and three rifles came out the side of that station wagon and I knew they'd been sent to kill us. I remember my pistol and I grabbed it out of my pocket and I fired all eight shots into the side of that car. Those rifles began to go off and I could hear the bullets whizzing by my head. Wing! Daddy always told me if you could hear the bullet going by, that means it missed you because the bullet travels faster than sound. And I remember them bullets whizzing by my body and all of us diving in another direction. But for now, my life was about to be changed forever. I remember running past the fence to jump into some bushes to hide. And a little innocent girl that was coming to get her ball that had bounced over the fence stepped out of that gate. An angel ran across that alley with her hand out looking for that ball. And I heard that thud. And when I heard that thud, I spun around as I was jumping through those bushes. And I watched that beautiful little 10-year-old blonde-haired girl as her, head turn, her hair turned to crimson red. And she fell. And she died. I remember running home and my dad had been drinking that night and I sat him down and I said, Daddy, there's been a shootout and I unloaded in the side of a car and, and Daddy, a little girl came out of the backyard and she took a bullet and Daddy, I watched her hair turn red and I think she's dead. 
It wasn't long until it was plastered all over the news if anybody had information leading to the death of a little girl that had been shot in an alley while playing ball. Nobody had known the story at the time. I remember going to her funeral. I remember passing by a little old pink casket of a 10-year-old girl. And her mother had some kind of crippling disease and she was in a wheelchair even though she was a young lady and she was patting her little daughter on the hand saying, this is my angel. This is my angel. And I was standing there looking at that little pink casket and the thought came to me, this ain't right. The innocent died for the ungodly. You should have died. You should have been shot. You ought to be laid out in a casket. It ain't right. The innocent dying for the ungodly. I found out who had pulled the trigger and me and several friends two days later went to the house and burned it down with him and his wife both in it asleep. Both of them escaped with some damages to their bodies and the house burnt to ashes. I was arrested. Child, charges were filed against me and two other brothers that had helped me burn the house down. But I couldn't get away from that little girl. I remember going to the mental ward and Dr. Lyons was my psychologist. I remember we would sit across the table from each other and he said, Phil, what do you want from me? And I remember leaning across the table and grabbing the lapels of his suit and I said, I want forgiven. I'm so messed up. Can somebody forgive me? I just need to get this off of me. I live with the guilt and the shame of the mess my life is in. Please get me out of this mess. They sent me to a mental ward. Now you think I'm crazy. You need to visit a mental ward. <laughs> Son, they hooked me up with a dude named Mark Green. You have to share a room. So we went in there and sat down and they got these little sessions where you sit in a circle and tell everybody what you want to do when you get out. Well, I, I knew what to say because all my friends had been there. I wanted to be a policeman and a fireman and wanted to be a contribute to the society. I knew what to say. And Mark was sitting next to me and he said, when I get out of here, I want to be a rooster. I said, you want to be a what? He said, I, 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 I want to be a rooster. I said, Mark, roosters don't get out of here. And can you believe they put my bed in the room with that dude? Now look, him perching on the bed all night, that's his business. I ain't got no problem with that. But that crowing at six o'clock in the morning got on my nerves. So they gave us Thorazine at night to knock us out because we was crazy. I'd give him mine too so he'd sleep in. You ever hear a drunk rooster at one o'clock in the afternoon trying to crow? Three tours to a mental ward. No relief. Three tours through dry out clinics. I remember the first time I came out dry and clean. I remember I went home and I told my mom, I said, I'm dry, I'm clean. I got my little chips. I finished all the classes. And before the sun rose the next day, I was back in the dark alley in my own vomit. You talking about one screwed up kid. No God, no Bible, no nothing. I get stabbed. A man stabbed me in, in a gang fight, and I forgave him. I got no hard feelings. I stabbed him back, but we're buddies to this day. And uh, I love, he's my friend, I, but I cut him like a hog, man. You cut me, I'll rake you in half. I cut him with an old hawk bill knife. You remember them? I cut him like a, like a hog. And I'm laying in the emergency room, and blood's everywhere, and they took snow and stuffed it in the incision. And I remember the next day the doctor said another quarter inch, son, you'd have bled to death and died right there in the snow. We was in a big gang fight and they knew I got cut and they were stuffing snow down in that incision until they come and rescued me and took me to the emergency room that night. And there I am laid in the emergency room, half slit, half open, just about nigh in the death. And I look and over in the corner of my head, falls to the left and I look and I said, man, this medicine's so strong, that looks like Buford and Florine standing over there. And that flooring come up to my bed and said, they're getting ready to take you into surgery, but we're praying for you. I said, look, I've been with roosters. I, I've, I've been to dry out clinics. I've been to shootouts. But you're the craziest folk I ever met in my life. Now I want to take you to November 21st, 1975. It's a little before 7 o'clock. Everybody's out, gone, doing their own thing on a Friday night. I took the pistol out that my daddy gave me when I was a 15-year-old boy. I was facing 50 years 
in Ohio State Penitentiary. They were going to try me as an adult, put me in an adult prison for 50 years of my life. And I remember sitting in the living room that night by myself. Nobody was there but me. You understand, I've never read a verse of scripture. I don't even know what church is. I've never darkened the door of a church. That's for old folk. I ain't going to no church. And I cocked that pistol and I said, I'm not pulling 50 years. I am not living 50 years behind a metal door. And I said, I'm just going to kill myself. I remember from that moment when I said that, it's almost like my life went into slow motion and it's hard to explain. But I remember loading that gun and hearing that click as that bullet went up into that chamber. And on a Colt automatic, you've got to squeeze the handle and the trigger. It's a safety feature. I remember putting that gun up against the side of my head. Everything got quiet. Slow motion. Bang! The phone starts ringing. <laughs> and it so startled me that I threw the gun. And it hit the wall and landed over there in the corner. This is way back before cell phones. And I grabbed the phone and I said, hey, Hello! It's Aunt Florine. I, I said, Aunt Florine, there's nobody here but me and I'm, I'm busy doing something. I got to go. She said, No, 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 no. Wait a minute, wait a minute. She said, You're why I'm calling. I said, What? What do you mean I'm white? You're calling. She said, Buford and I are going to revival tonight at church. Well, I didn't know what revival was. I'm from the ghetto. You go to church to play bingo. So I thought revival was bingo. I didn't know. And I said, well, I hope you win. That's what, I didn't know what else to say. God bless you. I'm praying for you. I hope you win. She said, no, no, I'm talking about revival. I said, oh, Florian, I don't even know what a revival is. She said, Phil, you listen to me now. She said, Buford and I are on the way out the door to get in our car to go to revival. I went to shut the door and lock it, and the Holy Ghost said, you need to call Phil and invite him to church. And the Holy Ghost said, had she not dialed your number, I'd have blown my brains out, and I'd already been in hell for 42 years. I looked at that pistol laying up against that wall, and I said, but Aunt I don't have any church calls. I've never been to church. I don't even have a Bible. I don't even know, I don't even know how you act in church. She said, come as you are. We'll come by and pick you up. Whoa, was that a mistake? She got in the car and she looked at Buford and said, Buford, he's a real any man. Worst mistake I ever made was getting in a Christian's car and I'm a dope addict. There's no roach clips hanging off the mirrors. They're playing music like I'd never heard. Everybody sounded like chickens on steroids. and They're all talking about God and they're in a good mood and they're sober and they're laughing. That was the longest journey I ever took in my life was trying to stay straight in a Christian car and here I am a dope head. We got to church that night. My God, there's 300 people there that night. Everybody saved but me. I walked in the back of that church. You understand, sir? I don't know what a church song is. I don't even know what you're talking about. Song director gets up there and says, let's everybody stand to your feet. He starts hopping around like a turkey having a seizure all over the platform. And they're singing Amazing Grace. I'd never heard that song before. And he's waving his hands and jumping all over. And, 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 and the men are going, Aah! and my aunt's standing there crying. And I leaned over. I said, now, Aunt Florian, you hear me now. He ain't the best singer I ever heard, but... Don't cry, it'll be over in a minute. He, 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 he'll run out of gas somewhere down the road. He can't jump like that all night. That's how dumb I was. They introduced an old ball-headed preacher. They had to help him to the pulpit. I said, dear God, I'm at a nursing home. Two guys get this old ball-headed man. He didn't stand this tall. He had a hunchback and he grabbed the pulpit and he said, I am what I am by the grace of God. I thought he was complaining. I didn't know what he was talking about. I thought, I felt like saying, shut up, old man. None of us feel good all the time. And that old man preached on hell for 30 minutes. Hung me out over hell. You could hear people weeping for their families all over that altar. 
He said, you're going to fry in hell. You're going to burn in hell. You're going to die without God. You'll suffer in a bottomless pit where the sun never shines and the birds never sing and the presence of God is never found and a prayer is never heard. I'm talking about a place where atheists become believers, condemned sinners get a burden for their family. I'm talking about a place where you'll never find God, you'll never find a baby, and you'll never find an altar of prayer. And then after he told me to go to hell for 30 solid minutes... They passed the offering plate. Now I'm on the back row. I'm taking all this eggs. I ain't never been through nothing like that. That offering plate gets to me and money's falling out of it. I mean, it just, it's, just, it's, just, it's an ocean of money. I leaned over to Aunt Florine. I said, let me tell you something, Aunt Florine. I've been to three men awards. I've lived 30 days with a man that thinks he's a rooster. This is the craziest place I've ever been. Man tell you to go to hell and you pay him to do it? Craziest place I ever been in my life. Man tell me to go to hell, I shoot him. That's how dumb I was. They helped the old goat down to the front after service. He's exhausted. Hyperventilating, they get him down front. Well, they, there was a line of people there. Well, I thought they were coming to complain. So I got in line with them. So bless God, there's something I want to say to that old man too. I didn't know anything about shaking hands and signing Bibles. I don't know what I'm doing. So I wait in line. Finally, I walk up to the old man. I say, hey, old goat, I want to ask you a question. When did God die and leave you in charge of everything? How do you know I'm going to hell? You're probably going to hell with me. You're just as crazy as I am. And I started to walk away. And he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, what? He said, are you a junkie? I said, yeah, I am. He said, I was too till I got saved. And he turned and walked away. I'll never forget going home that night. I got away from the preacher. I got away from church. I got away from my aunt and uncle. But somebody gave the Holy Ghost my address that night. Somebody told him where I lived. I had, an old, I had a trunk full of drugs that I had to deliver to Tommy and Ronnie that night. And I called them on the phone. I said, look, fellas, come get the drugs. Put the money under the seat. I don't feel good. He said, what's wrong with you? I said, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. But I'm telling you, I'm one sick dude, man. I'd started working in the funeral home. And I remember picking up bodies morning, noon, and night. And I laid down. And I, all I could hear was that old preacher say, you're going to hell. You're going to die without God, young man. You're going to go straight to hell when you die. All night long, I could hear that man say that in my head. And I, and I said, I'll tell you what, I'm just going to turn the light out and go to sleep. And about the time I rolled over to go to sleep, the thought went through my mind. You know how many people die in their sleep? I said, that ain't happening. Bless God, if I go to hell, I'm going with my eyes wide open. I ain't going to sleep for nobody. And I sat up in my bed all night. I didn't think the sun would ever break the midnight sky, but I remember calling Florine on the phone. And she answered the phone and said, hello. I said, shut up! I said, now you hear me and don't say another word. That old man, I said some mean stuff to him last night about going to hell and all that stuff, the old hunchback boy, that fella. He, he, he'll be dead before long, and I want to go back and, I don't know, for some dumb reason, I, I want to hear him again. But I bring him my own car. I ain't riding in your car. I like roach clips, rock music, smoke a joint or two. I'm bringing my own pad. So I met him at church. I walked in the back of that building. My hair was in a ponytail. I had on a dirty T-shirt, 36-inch bell-bottom blue jeans, four-inch white platform shoes, and already tattoos all up around my body. That's what I was that night. They introduced the old man, and sure enough, two people got him. They dragged him up to the pulpit. And I'm thinking, you think they could get somebody under 90 to hold a revival. And he grabbed that pulpit, and this is what he said. You got to remember that all night long, all I can hear is you're going to go to hell. You're going to go to hell. And he grabbed that pulpit, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, for some reason, God wants me to preach on hell again tonight. I said, you, you, you got to be clear. Are you kidding me? I said, Aunt Florine, that's called dementia. The man has, all he can do is tell people to go to hell. Put him in a nursing home. I'll pay for his bedpan and hearing aid. Get that guy out of the pulpit. All he says is go to hell and you pay him to do it. I didn't know nothing about an invitation. All I know is I walked out of a mental ward with my daddy and they begged him to sign me away. 
First time I ever saw my daddy cry in my life. He said, Mr. Kid, shine on the dotted line. We'll put him away till he's 21. My daddy broke down weeping, Brother Butler, and said, I can't do it. But he said, Mr. Kid, let me tell you something about your son. That boy's so wild and he's so crazy that one of these days he's going to snap just like that. And he said, just like that, he's going to snap. He'll never be the same. Right in the middle of that old man preaching on hell, he leaned over the pulpit and I watched his lip begin to quiver and I thought, what's wrong with him? And a big old tear popped out of his eye and ran down his face. It was clear as crystal. And he leaned over that pulpit and he said, ladies and gentlemen, the good news of the gospel is Jesus took your hell. God sent his only begotten son to die on a cross and shed his blood. And God loves you. I'd never heard that in my life. I remember leaning over and grabbing Aunt Florine by the hand, facing 50 years in a state penitentiary. I said, Aunt Florine, if he knew where I'd been, if that man's known what all I've done, he wouldn't tell everybody that God loves them because he can't love me. And she said, Phil, that's why we wanted you to come. God loves you. Jesus died for you. God sent his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And at 15 minutes after eight, I didn't know I was supposed to wait to the end of the service. I didn't know. 15 minutes after eight, God the Holy Ghost got a hold of me and I realized who I was and who he was. And with my hair in a ponytail and 36 inch bell bottom blue jeans and four inch white platform shoes, I stood up in front of 300 people and stepped out of that pew. And when I started making my way to Jesus, God saved me before the first mossy back Baptist ever put their nasty hands on me. God had already recorded my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And at 15 minutes after eight, God reached down in a bad situation, applied his blood to a little dirty face hippie boy and saved me out of all of my sins. It's the best day of my life. It's the day I got born again. Now, I got saved at 15 minutes after eight. 13 of us got saved that night. They lined up all 13 of us across the front of the church. If you'd have took the whores, the dope addicts, and the murderers out of that crowd, there'd have been two left. 13 of us in one of the nastiest ghettos in this country stood in front of a church. I'll never forget I got saved at 15 minutes after eight. I didn't know nothing, nothing about God. I didn't know anything. But I remember getting up and wiping tears from my eyes and I looked and I looked across that building and people were going like this. I thought, well, I got to jump in with them. I didn't know why they were jumping, but I thought it looked right, so I got to jump in with them. By the way, I still jumped 42 years later. But let me tell you why they were jumping. That little old church we was in had a floor about like this one. Feels more like a trampoline than it does a floor. And that flooring weighed about 300 pounds. And she'd been praying for me every day for two years, once in the morning and once at night. When she saw me getting saved, she took off around that auditorium in a Baptist church, shouting and screaming. And she was so big, when her foot had hit the floor, everybody around her would bounce up like a trampoline. We got saved at 15 minutes after eight. We shouted till 10.30. I walked two blocks home and remembered I drove a car. I had to go back and get my car. My pastor sitting on the hood with his arms folded. He said, I was wondering where in the name of God you went. I said, I don't know what all happened to me, but if you'll pour a little more on me, I'll just fly to the house and come get my car some other time. Hey, the best thing I've ever done, the best day of my life, I've never been sorry that I trusted his name and I got born again. So, so November 22nd, 1975, I got saved. Dad and I, if you come up in a heavy drinker's home, you'll understand 
Dad and I had a lot of problems with our relationship. And to be honest, most of it was me. And uh, it was strange. When I got up to the altar that night, the first thing that happened to me was I fell in love with my daddy. And he was so drunk before I left that night. I remember getting in my car and going home, and the closer I got to home, the more I, I was just in love with my dad. And I had to tell him that I loved him. I went home, and Uncle Buford and Aunt Florine brought me a big family altar Bible. I meant to bring it tonight. Big old white family altar Bible. So here I go walking home with my hair in a ponytail, 36-inch bell-bottom blue jeans, four-inch plat white platform shoes, and the biggest King James Bible you've ever seen in your life. And I walk in the house, my mama said, what's wrong with you? I said, mama, I got saved. She said, go to bed, we'll talk about it in the morning. I said, I need to talk to my daddy. She said, he's in bed and he's drunk. I said, mama, I'm not going to bed till I talk to daddy. Now looking back on it, I didn't do it right. But you gotta understand, man, I just got relieved of a lot of stuff. This is the first breath of fresh air I'd had in a long time. And Dad was in bed drunk, and I didn't even turn the line on. I went running into the bedroom with that big Bible under my arm, and I jumped up right in the middle of his bed. And he spun around, and he sat up. Mom come in and turned the light on, and I was standing there with that Bible over my drunk dad. He said, son, that psychiatrist said it happened just like that. I said, Dad, he was right. He was right. At 15 minutes after 8 tonight, God saved me. He changed me just like that. He changed me just like that. And guess what, Daddy? I'll never be the same. I'll never be the same. I'll never be the same. And for 42 years, I've been a nobody telling everybody about a somebody that can save anybody. Much more I can say, but I want to close with this. Some of you may not understand why we're so happy. I understand that. Let me give you an illustration. I've preached 30 minutes. I, I get paid by the hour. That's all Brother Castle bought was 30 minutes. <laughs> if you guys will beef the offerings up next year, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> a friend of mine went to make a visit not long ago, and he got out of his car, and he's like me. He's not really a dog person. I'm not against dogs. I just, if you got one, take care of it. But I believe all dogs are lost. I believe they all got demons in them. They all go to hell. That's why they're called hot dogs. <laughs> the only thing that's going to beat your dog to hell is that nasty cat on your front porch. <laughs> oh, Lord. He said, I got out of the car, and he said, this dog was on its hind legs out in the front yard, and it was going like this. Then it would run around. The guy that owned the house said he'd just run around in circles till his tongue hung out that far. He said, I was afraid to get out of the car thinking there's something wrong with that dog. He said, I rolled my window down and said, sir, I'd like to talk to you, but I'm, I never seen a dog jump and spin that crazy like that. He said, oh, that's just because of what happened. He said, well, what happened? He said, well, he's just an old mutt. He said, we don't have no papers on him. He's just an old crossbreed mutt. There ain't nothing to him. He ain't worth nothing. And he said, our septic tank was full. We called the guy in to pump our septic tank. I like those guys. I saw a sticker on the back of one of them trucks the other day. It says, nobody puts their nose in our business. I like that. <laughs> and he moved the lid off that septic tank and put that hose, brand new truck, and got it half empty, and that pump went out on that brand new truck. He came out and told me, he said, my old truck runs fine. And he said, just let me go get my old tanker. We'll bring it up here and finish it, but be careful the lid's off that septic tank. He said, me and my father were standing out here, and this old mutt dog was by my feet, and he said, a squirrel went across the yard. And he said, whoa, boy, nope. But he said, you're wasting your time when a squirrel. He said, there went that dog. He said, he's a running wide open chasing that squirrel. And he jumped over that ridge and saw the lid missing off that septic tank. And in midair, he's trying to find reverse to back up. He said, me and my father was standing there and we heard a splash. He said, dad and I walked over that septic tank about half full, and he said, that dog's paddling in all that filth. And he said, while he's trying to stay above all that filth, he looked at me as if to say, don't you even care? 
He said, my father leaned over and said, now son, there's nothing to that dog. He ain't worth nothing. But if you love him, you're going to have to go after him. Because he sure can't get out of the mess he's in. He said, preacher, I went and got a ladder and stuck it down in that filth. And I went down in that nasty septic tank to get that dog that wasn't worth a dime. Just a nasty dog. He said that dog was so messed up, when I'd reach out to get him, he'd fight me. He's just fighting everything. He said, but I just kept reaching out. Kept re and this, he said, finally, he just quit fighting. You can get out of the mess you're in if you'll just quit fighting. You'll just quit fighting. He said, when he quit fighting, I reached over and grabbed that nasty thing and pulled it to me. And I brought it up the ladder. Oh, it was nasty. And he said, I set it down in the yard and I took a water hose. And he said, I not only got it out of the pit, but I was going to wash it from all that mess he is in. And he said, I took that water hose and sprayed all that filth off that dog. And he said, ever since I've cleaned him up, that's how he's been acting. Spinning around in circles, jumping around me and the father. He said, I don't know if he'll ever stop that. He said, preacher, don't you think? And he said, I looked at the preacher and he said, I stand in there crying. He said, preacher, what you crying about? He said, I'll tell you what I'm crying about. A long time ago, I was a nobody going down for the last time. And I ain't, they ain't much to me, but God said, Jesus, if you love him, you're gonna have to go down to where he's at because he sure can't get out of it on his own. And he said, God brought me out of a horrible pit, put my feet on a solid rock, put a new song in my mouth, even praises unto our God, wash me from all of my filth. You better believe I'm gonna jump. You better believe I'm gonna shout. You better believe I'm gonna turn around. The greatest day of my life was the day I got born again. You see, my life started with a pistol, but it ended with a bang. And the same God that saved me is the same God, son, that can save you. The Edwards family is coming. I'm done. I've preached 33 minutes. Thank you for your time. I'm finished. Thank you for being here. I need an invitation song quickly, and I'm leaving. And you guys were so respectful tonight. Thank you. Would you stand to your feet quietly and promise me you won't make any noise or move around? This will take just a minute, and I'm leaving. Just a moment, and I'll be done. So many great men of God here. Could I trust you men to pray for me right now? Could I trust you? Please, nobody talking. Please don't do that to me now. Please don't do that to me. I've preached my heart out trying to help you. Promise me you won't do that. I want you to do me a favor. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed. I'm not coming to you. I'm not pointing at you. I'm not looking at you. I want to pray for you. You listen to me carefully, son. Because what you do in the next couple of minutes may determine where you spend forever. And forever is a long, long time. While our heads are bowed, you're not going to lift your hand because of your buddy or your brother or sister or your husband or your wife. But if tonight while our heads are bowed, while nobody's looking, how many of you remember that day? I'm not talking about getting baptized, joining the church and starting to read your Bible. But you remember that day when you were forever lost and you got born again. And you're willing to die. Hey, you're willing to die in the shape you're in right now. I want you to lift your hand. I'm willing to die, preacher man. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Now, Brother Castle, you did look, and I want to thank you. But I'm not exaggerating now, preacher. I'm talking three to 400 people. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not talking about playing games here now. I drove down here with, with business on my mind. Listen to me, young people. Please listen to me. Promise me. You couldn't lift your hand. So I want you to do me a favor. If you're here right now and you could not lift your hand, I'm saying, I'm giving conservative estimate there was at least 300. And I want to thank you because 42 years ago, I couldn't lift mine either. So while every head's bowed, if you could not lift your hand, but you'd like for me to pray for you, that's all. I don't even want you to lift your hand. I just want you to look at me. I want you to look at me right now. Keep looking at me. And by you looking at me, you're saying, brother, kid, pray for me. I'm lost. I want Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you, son. God bless you, men. 
God bless you, young ladies. All through this middle section, probably a hundred. There's at least a hundred people looking at me just through the middle section. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, son. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you. Over to my left, preacher, pray for me. Look at these beautiful young people. God bless you, honey. God bless you, young man. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. Thank you. You can bow your heads again. Now, for those hundreds that looked at me, you were asking me to pray for you. And that's what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to ask you to do what I did 42 years ago. I'm going to ask you to step out of your seat and meet Phil Kidd right here. I want you to meet Phil Kidd right here. And by coming, you're saying, Preacher, I too want to receive that Jesus that saved you. After I pray, we're going to sing. Christians, I need, your, I need your heads bowed. I need you to seek God. There's 300 lost people here tonight. My God. Some of you moms and dads need to get each other by the hand and say, look, let's go get this thing settled with God. You said, preacher, you ought to see where I live, what I'm out of. It doesn't matter. I'm telling you, God loves you right where you're at, buddy. Father, I want to pray for these like I'd want them to pray for me. They're lost. And I beg you for every boy and girl, every mom and dad, sister, brother, son and daughter that looked at me. I pray you'd give them that strength to take that first step and meet me right here. And I promise you, I promise you we'll give you all the glory. Now while our heads are bowed, all over the building right now, would you promise me you won't put it off? If you looked at me and you wanted prayer, they're singing right now. How many of you will come join me? That's right, son. Come on, Tiny. They're coming. That's right. Come on. Get out of your seat. Come on. Sing it, brother. Here we go. Come on. They're coming right now. Just join me right here, brother. Stand right here. Come on. Here we go. Come on, brother. Here we go. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. That's right. Let, let me get everybody up here, brother. Let me get everybody up here. Come on. They're coming from everywhere. That's right, honey. Come on. Come on. Let's go. As they sing, come on. Come on. From everywhere. Come on. Come on. Come on. They're coming from everywhere. Get out of your seat. Come on. Come on, you looked at me, son. You asked me to pray for you. Come on. They're coming from all over the building. Come on. Come on, that's right. Get out of your seat. They'll let you out. Come on, all of you gather around here with me. Come on. Look at all these people coming to get saved. Let's give them a hand while they're coming. Look at all these people coming to Jesus right now. Come on. Come on. Come on, keep coming, young people. Come on. Come on, son, keep coming. Come on, keep coming, keep coming. Come on. Come on, keep coming. Come on, preachers, help me pray. Come on, preachers. Look at all of them coming. Come on down, come on down, come on down, come on down, come on, come on, workers, help me, preachers, come help me get these people to God. Come on, they're still coming, they're still coming. Come on, preachers, come on, help me get these people to God. Brother Castle, help me out here. Come on, they're still coming. Soul winners, soul winners, soul winners, come, come on, they're everywhere. Soul winners, people everywhere, they're everywhere getting saved. Come on, come on, they're still coming. Come on, you looked at me. Preacher, pray for me. I prayed for you. Come on, get out of your seat right now. Don't put it off, son. Come on. Come on, while Jesus is calling. Come on, they're still coming. They're still coming. Come on. Take that step, honey. Come on, God will save you if you'll take that step. Come on, come on, do it right now. Come on. Let's give them a hand while they're still coming. Let's give them another hand while they're coming. Come on, they're still coming. They're still coming. Come on, honey, that's right. Come on. And oh, they're still coming. That's right, young man. Come on. Come on. They're still coming from everywhere. Come on. Come on. They're still coming. Come on. Come on. Call on God tonight. Call on God tonight. Come on. Come on. Come on. They're still coming. Come on tonight. Come on. Come on. Get them to Jesus tonight, church. Get them to Jesus tonight. Get them to Jesus tonight. Somebody talk to these girls right now. Come on. They're still coming. Come on, workers, I need you to clear the aisles. They're still coming. That's right, Mama. Come on, Mama, bring that baby. Come on down to this altar, Mama. Come on down. Hey, workers, give these people a chance to get to the altar. Come on. They're still coming from everywhere. Come on. Come on, come on. Let's give this Mama a hand. Come on down with her, baby. Let's give her a hand. Call on God, son. Call on God. Call on God, honey. Call on God. Don't you want this to be the night where you settle it with you and God? 
Started with a pistol. Come on, honey, we'll get you to Jesus right here. We'll get you to Jesus. They want to pray with you, brother. That's right. They're still coming. They're still coming. Come on. Come on, step out of that seat. Come on, I want you to meet me right here. Come on. Come on tonight. Come on. Are you coming? Come on. He never gave up. He never gave up. He won't give up on you. Come on. They're still coming. They're still coming. Clear the aisles, preacher. They're still coming. They're still trying to get to God. Come on. Come on. They're trying to get to God. They're still coming. They're still coming. Come on, we'll make room. Come on. We got to get some room at the altar, brother. We got to get some room. They're over flooding the altar. Come on, come on. Somebody else going to step out tonight? Come on, you looked at me. I prayed for you. Did you really mean it? Do you really want to settle this with Jesus tonight? I want to ask you to step out. Come on, I'll meet you. Coming? Are you coming? If your back's against the wall, are you coming? Come on. You feel Come on. You all hope is gone. Have you often asked yourself, Come on. is there reason to go on? There's others. Come on. He looks Come on. We'll wait on you, brother. Come on. Come on, son. God's dealing with you. Come on. Don't put it off tonight. Come on. Son, lead them to Jesus right there, brother. Lead them all to Jesus, brother. Hey! Hallelujah! Help yourself, brother. Glory to God in the land.
You know, I, uh, man, I've seen God do so much in this building tonight. People come a long way. Preacher, how long did it take you to get here tonight? Man, brother. Huh? I was talking to a couple hours, and his boys got saved tonight. Both of his boys got saved. Go several hours. That's, that's two brothers hugging each other there. Both of them just, I said both of them just got born again. Great God in the morning. Hey, what a Savior. What a Savior. I just wonder. I just wonder. I just wonder if I sung one more verse. Was there one boy or girl that said, you know, I needed to go and I missed it. But if they'd sing one more verse, I'd come. Is that you? Preacher, if they'd sing one more verse, I'm the one that needs to step out of my chair. I'm the one that put it off. Why don't you get somebody next to you by the hand and say, look, I'm one of those that need to go to the altar. Would you come pray with me? I need to come. We're going to sing one more verse. If nobody comes, I'm done. Please, please, don't say no to God, honey. While we sing this verse just for you, come on, meet me here right now. Come on. Come on, if you need Jesus, meet me here. Come on, honey. Come on, is there somebody else? That's right, son. Come on. That's right. Anybody else? Preacher, I should have moved. God spoke to my heart. I knew I should have come. I thought I missed it, brother kid. But I'm singing one more verse just for you. That's right, brother. Come on. Let's give him a hand while they're coming. They're still coming. They're still coming. They're still coming. He won't give up on you if you'll come. Come on. Come on. Jesus is ready. With open arms. If you pray with him, brother, they got what they needed. Yes. And I'm sure that you'll agree. He never once ever gave up on me. If you could see what he knocked. You know, I'm glad he didn't give up on me. I'm glad all them times when I was running up and down the road as a teenager, the Lord didn't give up on me. Tell it, Brother Castle. He didn't give up on me, and he hadn't give up on you. If he had, you'd have done been dead and gone. That's it, Brother Castle. He ain't give up on you. There's hope. There's hope for you tonight. There's hope for you tonight. He loves you. He loves you. You'll never be in a better atmosphere, you see, than what there is in here tonight. You're never going to be in no better atmosphere than what it is in here tonight. He's right. He's right. Hey. You better listen. Don't pass. Don't say I'm going to wait till next year. Don't say I'm going to go to church maybe next Sunday. Don't say, well, I'm going to wait a while. Do it tonight while yeah. you got a chance. Tell it, There's tell people it. dying every minute while we're standing up here. Lost, just like me and him was. And they it. never get out. You never get out. Never you burn out. and scream forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And you on, never honey. get out. Let me get you to Jesus. Come on. Sun's up here still praying. Come on, you come. come on. Sing one more verse. Come one on. more. Christians, don't you get weary. Yeah, that's right. Don't you get weary. There's nothing you got to do more important than what yeah, God's doing here tonight. It. Let God speak to you tonight. You come. Come on. Come, come on. on, children. Come on. I'll pray on. with you. Come on. Come on. Get come out of your seat. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Just get out of your seat. Young lady. Come on. Come on. Teenager. Come on. Let's go. Let's Move go. right now. Move right now. Help you right now. Come on. We help you right now. Come on. Come on. Yeah, come on. 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 Come on.
That's right. God's working on. Yes. If you got saved listen, here tonight. Listen, come on. If you got saved here tonight, so you got right Jesus to be your Savior tonight. Yeah. You got it settled. You got it settled tonight. I want you to come back up here and we'll get right here and we're going to pray for you. And then we're going to let come you. Come on, I want to stand come on. with you. Come on. Come on, right now. All of you, come on, right come now. Come on, come on. Everybody. Stand right down here. Let's go. Come on, let's you go. You got it saved tonight. Come everybody, on, back come up on. here. Get out of your One seat. Come on. Come on, I want a picture with everybody. Yeah, come on. I want to get my picture with all of you. Come Amen. on. Let's go. Everybody you got, got saved, saved here tonight. Come on. Come on. Come on. Hey, come, on. come on. If you got saved tonight, come on. Come on, right now. Everybody, come on. Get back up here. Don't take your picture. Come on. Come on. Amen. Hallelujah. They're coming in the choir. Come on, let's get up here. Everybody hey, got saved. You got saved here tonight. Send them up here, let's brother. Give them a hand while Where's yours man? at? Aren't you glad that they got Come saved on. tonight? Get them up here, brother. Come on, you got saved tonight. Come on, we're going to pray for you. Come on. We're going to pray for you tonight. Come on, everybody got saved. Man. Hey, man. Come on, brother. Whoa. Come on, brother. Look at all this, man. Is this Come on, we're Come on, y'all. Come on, get up here. We're going to pray for you. Yes, Jesus. We're yes. going to pray for you before you go. Yes. You got saved here tonight. Come on, more of you. Let's go. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Come up here. Come up here right now. Come on. Come on, I want to pray with you. Come on. Here comes some more, preacher. Here Amen. Let's more. go, y'all. Amen. Amen. Come on. Come on, brother. You boys, come up here. Amen. Come up here. Yes. Come on. If you got saved, come up here tonight. Yes. Uh, come on, if you got Lord, saved, I know there's probably here. at least 50. Come on, bring them up here. Let's go. Come on up here, brother. Come on up here. Everybody that got saved. Come hey, on. man, come on, y'all. Bring all these up here. Come on, come on. All them, come on, honey. I'm glad you got saved, boy. I wish I'd have got saved when I was your age. Yeah. Oh, dear God. Come on, brother, let God. You know, I've heard people say, oh, them brother. little kids don't know what they're doing. Glad you got Look at that young brother. man right there. They prayed with that many Isn't that something? Isn't that brother. something, y'all? Glad That's what youth brother. rally's for right there. Yeah! That's what youth rally's for right there. That's a man we've been looking for right there. You've been praying hey. for him? Yeah, he got saved tonight, brother. What's your name? Amen, brother. Amen. Okay. Huh? Amen. Just stay here, brother. We want to get a picture with him. Everybody got it? You ready? There's All some right. more over here still praying. All right. Here comes some more. Come on. Let, There's been over more. 40. Get there. That's 40. Okay. That's every one of you get a new Bible tonight. To Amen. Say. We're going to give every one of them a new Bible. Amen. Thank you, brother. Let's Bible. give Chad a hand, man. Thank you. Amen. Let's give him a hand for that donation. We appreciate that. Let's get a picture, brother. He's the one that's got that crazy... Did y'all see that crazy bus out there? Everybody see that crazy bus out oh, there? Oh, man. That guy got some guts, ain't he? You drive you know that through Washington, D.C. So you know where I was at. You get a drive-by so real quick. Been, right? He's going to give them all a brand new Bible. How old are you, brother? Hey, there's some people in here got some guts, man. Preach on the subways in New York City. On the subways, y'all. Lord have mercy. You got to survive. Amen. Brother Danny. Yes, this boy is 32 years old. He's been a gang member, been shot, raised hell, dope addict, mean as a snake. And he said, Preacher, your life was so much like mine. He said, I've been shot, been stabbed. I've me. been shot, cut, stabbed, hit by five cars, school bus, paralyzed twice, pronounced dead three times, life support twice, 12 years old. I was a, I was a crip gang member. Selling drugs, doing drugs, drinking, partying, smoking, Are you listening? chilling. It's my kind of people, man. In and out of prison, in and out of jails. But tonight you got saved. But tonight, man, I'm free, man. <laughs> <laughs>